from Messi. Oh, what a goal it is! Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of the Bola Bola Show podcast. It's me, Sivan, and joining us after a lengthy break and a long time is none other than my co-host and good buddy, Bala. Hey, Bala. How's it going, man? All right. Hi, Sivan. Yes, thank you for long, for, for inviting me back again. I think it's been a while. I think, uh, hope get back with Bola Bola Show on Moral again. I think this is a very great episode. And uh, yeah, we are looking forward for the show. Mm, okay, okay, okay. It's an interesting episode. Because if those of you who remembered in our previous episode, we did a joint collaboration with uh, our good friend from Singapore, Ras Finder, on the back pass with Ras. On that episode, we focused mainly on the Malaysian Football League of the 90s. We're talking about all the great side of Selangor, uh, Pahang, even the Singapore 94 teams, all those great teams from that 90s era. But on this episode, it's we are doing the host. That one was hosted by Ras. On this occasion, we are taking over the hosting duty. So, without further ado, welcome Ras to the Bola Bola Show. Hi, Ras. Hey, Steven. Hi, Bala. It's been so nice to see you after a long time, Bala. I got to say that again. Oh, uh, Steven, nice seeing you again. Um, <laughs> looking forward to this show. It'll be yep, an interesting yep. show. Okay, okay. Uh, and also, I'll give a bit of a background of myself. Sure, sure, go ahead. And how and how this uh, episode today will relate to me, but maybe we'll speak about that later. And of course, joining us again, or joining myself and Russ again on this uh, particular episode, is none other than our good friend also from Singapore, Gary. Welcome on board, Gary. I think this is your first time as a guest on the Bola Bola show, right? Um, I think if with Bola Bola as the forefront, I think that's the first time. Mm-hmm. But it's great to see you, Sivan, and Ras again, and first time meeting up with Bala online, so good, good to see you here, Bala. Bala, yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Nice to meet you. Okay. Uh, nice to see you as well, Gary. Yep. Okay. So, guys, as remember, we, in our previous episode, hosted on the back pass with Ras, it was all about the Malaysian Football League of the 90s. On this episode, it's a Malaysia Day special. It's all about Harimo Malaya in the 90s. Now, uh, just to give everybody a preamble, when it comes to the Malaysian Football League in the 90s, it was very colourful. But I'm not too sure the same can be said about Harimau Malaya. But we will go into it further. Um, just to give a little bit of background, when we won the SEA Games gold medal in 1989, mm-hmm. following year, the Malaysian Football League has decided that it will go uh, open a new era in which it will become a semi-pro league. And going to this new decade, there was kind of a an expectation, I suppose, from football fans that, you know, this decade is going to be an exciting one. There will be more glory and more amazing things to happen with regards to the Malaysian national team. But uh, as the saying goes, it's not everything was smooth sailing. But nevertheless, we will start with 1991. I'm going to go with you on this, Bala. Because you know why? We did an episode specially on this during the first pandemic, which yeah. is the game between Malaysia versus England. So yeah, yeah. what's your memory of this game? And take us through it, man. I think I think there's two... I think basically there's two highlights. Like one is Gary Dineker and also I think Matla Majana. Because I think they are the two the, the scorer of the uh, game, actually. And of course, Gary Lineker scored four goals with the Matla Manja responding with two goals in this. Uh, with, I would say one of the greatest England side since I think they were in the in the 1990. They were semi finalists, so I think it's a remarkable uh, game for Malaysia, especially Manja. And mm. uh, with the what with the weather as a part of the thing, it was a very hype in the school. I remember we were talking about it, and uh, I think it was one of the greatest game I think Malaysia have played. With again, it's a very uh, I would say. Probability, uh, one of the very good opponent. I think after that, I think they met Brazil. I think one of the other mm-hmm. eight team. Uh, so I think that one of the highlights uh, of the of tournament. I mean, I mean, it's one of the at the time I think it's under five. 
Mm-hmm. It was a very good, uh, incredible memories, especially with uh, Malaysia losing for three zero in the first half. Then they responded two goals. We gave five lah. So yeah, it was a very good memory game. Mm, okay, okay. I mean, I you summed it up perfectly well. You know, we played against a very tough opponent. And yeah. you know, I think England also. If I look at their lineup, that it, it wasn't really much of a, it wasn't really experimental lineup. I think it was a very strong lineup, and the fact that yeah. we managed to respond two goals says a lot about uh, the game itself. And, and uh, most, even I just got to know today. I just because hmm. this before this Google I've been, I just found out that England never did any substitution just for the info. Oh, okay, oh. okay, okay. Ah, this was wow. a friendly, and England hmm. never did uh, substitution. And even in fact, nation had two substitution at the half time. But what I'm trying to say is, in England, basically they experimented with a strong squad. Even Ian Wright was in the bench now. Actually, mm, okay, uh, okay. And David Betty was was playing. David Platt was playing. Wow. Uh, George okay, okay. Thomas, John Salako. You know, initially I thought the mm. last time during our CM era, but the sound is English for us. So it's not a it's not a weak team to be to start. With. Even Des Walker was playing as a defender there. Mm. Yeah, the Blackburn legend Stuart Pearce also was there so it's not uh, yep 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 wow okay I mean you when you go through the lineup I can only imagine you know what kind of formidable team that England team was for those of you guys in Singapore I mean do you guys have any recollection about this game well I've en- encountered it from a newspaper previously when Ter- Terry Venables visited Singapore and there was a mention about that England Malaysia friendly in 91 but apart from that not so much from my record recollection although that said I mean if I want to go back a, a bit of history if you all don't mind actually go ahead, go ahead man actually Singapore had played England at almost every level except the main the main national team we had played England B way back in 1978 which we lost 0-8 and then we had played England under 20s when Michael Owen Jamie Carragher and company they were here in Singapore for the warm-up ahead of the 1997 World Youth Championship in Malaysia. And then later, subsequently, there was also, an I think, an England under-18, if I'm not wrong, where they also had a friendly with us as well. There was also mm-hmm. even one England or FA Select team way back in 1961, which included Sir Tom Finney and the likes, but it's not the same as having the full England national team on our shores. So mm-hmm. that's where Malaysia has a very unique achievement and a milestone in this regard. Yeah, I just remember not too much, not too uh too much in detail, but of course I remember England playing uh Malaysia and Lineker scoring four goals. So I'm not sure if I saw it maybe on TV, you know, on the highlights on TV, the news news uh, coverage highlights or was it on the newspaper? I, I remember uh, some glimpses of this mention of this game. Uh, I, don't, I think probably most likely will be on Malaysian TV that I remember it on. But anyway, 1991 wasn't just about the match against England. And in fact, that game could have been served also as a preparation as the national team goes into the 91 SEA Games as defending champion, there was a big task ahead of defending that gold medal. Gary, maybe you want to take us through about, you know, what would happen in that SEA Games. Actually, what I do recall about Harima Malaya in the 91 SEA Games was that very, was the big, was the shock result of the tournament where Malaysia lost to Philippines and Philippines throughout his, his football history, especially after the Second World War. It was never known to be a powerhouse. It was like Philippines were the host. Yes, they do not have any half blood or heritage players like they have in the Barcelona today. No, they don't have that. But apparently, what they had is a uh, the group of deter- determined local base players who are de- who are keen to do well on home soil. And I'm not exactly sure what happened, but that result really resonated. And for your for your information, actually that. SEA Games saw Indonesia succeed Malaysia as the gold medalist. Singapore finished bronze after defeating Philippines yeah. in the fourth place playoff. And the runners up were Thailand, if I'm not wrong. Do you guys remember anything about that yep. uh, SEA Games? I mean, generally, I remember the defeat against Philippines like, at that time. It, I mean, mm. it was a shock to all of us because historically, we never lo- lost to the Philippines. Yeah, after that. correct. So, yeah, I mean, the, but what we did not anticipate that it's going to create a chain of reaction as the years to come. Yeah, yeah. I think basically, I think it's a shocking kind of thing like, because it's, I think Philippines are supposed to be a weeping boys. 
Correct. By the, by the end of the Malaysia got whipped. Later on, we started off with the Ken Warden era. I think we went to a list of local coaches and finally we went back to a foreign coach. Ken Warden came on board, if I'm not mistaken, sometime around 92 or 93. Obviously, his first task was definitely, uh, obviously, the USA 94 World Cup qualifier. And, of course, subsequently, you know, trying to put the 91 SEA Games behind and hopefully in 93, which was hosted in Singapore. Think, yep. Correct? correct. Yes. Yeah. Yep. So, so, Raz, this was happening in your own backyard, man. Take us through. Yeah. Okay. So, now this is probably the time I will give you a bit of explanation on my background. So, for those who do not know, in terms of citizenship, yeah, I'm Singaporean, but I'm of mixed parentage, so I'm half Malaysian, half Singaporean. And uh, so my family is is in this way that the cousins that I have, they are Singaporeans, they don't like Singapore, you know, for some reason, they, you know, whenever it comes to international matches like this, they do not support Singapore, so they don't really encourage uh, me to support Singapore. But at that point, of course, 93, 94, I was a Singapore fan when it came to Malaysia Cup days. But during this time, when it came to SEA Games, I was still pretty much a neutral. So, I'm sure on like, I can't say for sure that, okay, you know, I remember all how the games went and, uh, and all. But I did do a research and I saw that, you know, Malaysia actually started pretty well in the tournament. But then... Uh, suffered a couple of uh, defeats to Myanmar and Thailand and that led to their uh, elimination again in the group stage. I guess losing to Myanmar would have been probably a bit of a surprise, but later on in the tournament, we found out very famously in Singapore that Myanmar no pushovers. And uh, do you remember anything about the World Cup qualifiers that particular year? Because that World Cup qualifier, we had Saudi, we had uh, Kuwait and we had Macau. Kuwait. The first leg Kuwait. in Kuala Lumpur, we did pretty well. We did very well, in fact. I think we topped the group on goal difference. I think we were equal points uh, with Saudi and Kuwait. But uh, we had a better goal difference that made us top of the group. And I think there was a lot of uh, hope that we could make it past the group, uh, the group stage for the first time in history. But uh, as you know, when we went to Saudi Arabia... We lost the first two games against the two Middle East side and that pretty much dashed our hope. And little did we know that one year later, that very same Saudi team will cost a major surprise in USA 94. I mean, yeah, correct. you guys remember anything? I mean, what about you, Bala? You remember? Yeah, that's what I remember very clearly because I think uh, I think one of the newspaper articles when, you know, Zainal Abidin, I think not, not the same Zainal Abidin all going to the Saudi that they were treated they were yes, like yes. Uh, superheroes. Because the uh, what Malaysia was on par with the Saudi Arabia and uh, like what is this even this was the Saudi Arabia team which you know did went up to second round to the World Cup and uh, one of the one of the I think after Maradona I would say one of the second or third greatest goal for all time. Oh, absolutely, man, absolutely. <laughs> so I yeah. think. Said uh, Waran. Uh, so basically, yep, I think the so Saudi cool. team is uh, not a joke, like basically. So what yeah. Malaysia did, despite maybe not make it to the next round, but it's still a great achievement. I think. Mm-hmm. Yep, I remember. I remember those uh, those news uh, coverage on the team travel to Saudi Arabia. You know, whereby the camera actually even went into the players' hotel rooms and all that. You can yeah. see oh. both Zainal and Dola. Where they were practically roommates. You know, when the moment they opened the room door, they were jumping on the bed and all that. All it was <laughs> quite quite a, a hilarious side of the of the team. <laughs> I think a pretty impressive also, result, I must say, against uh, drawing against Kuwait and Saudi in Malaysia. That's very impressive. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is. I mean, uh, at home, we were quite competitive, like I would say. Yeah, I think I think par. Saudi Arabia scored a last minute goal, something like that. I think Malaysia was taking the lead. I think. Mm. Yeah, 88 something minute, like 88 yeah, 18... minute penalty. Saudi ah, Arabia. Yeah, probably, wow. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. I remember that. Well, it, would, it, might, it, might, it wouldn't, I think, I don't know if luck was with this. I think maybe even I won the game actually. <laughs> mm. Okay, okay. Yeah. All right. So, moving on to Ken Warden, and here comes the probably the most interesting coach mm-hmm. that we had in, in the Malaysian national team in 90. Uh, in, I think he came, in, he came in on board, if I'm not mistaken, sometime in 94, Claude Leroy. I'm sure, Bala, you have uh, plenty of memories about this particular coach with the national team, especially a few years down the road where we will end up seeing him. Oh, of course. <laughs> I think when he newly joined, uh, we was. 
expectation, I think, if I'm not mistaken, to Malaysia to qualify for Olympics in 1996. That's one of the reasons why he came in. It was actually a good squad. and uh, But I think the expectation to go to, to go Olympics is a bit uh, challenging. Lah. Yeah, I think with the, with, the, with the African success, I mean, especially Senegal, I think he came a lot of ideas. But uh, unfortunately, I think he couldn't replicate what he did in Africa to here, maybe because of the style or... Is it maybe it's too soon? Uh, or Malaysia is not ready for this kind of coach. Maybe for especially in the uh, grassroots level, still up, up upcoming. Nevertheless, I think it's one of the last uh, high profile coach who came into Malaysia. Mm-hmm, um, yep. And after that, I think all uh, I think we, we, I, I couldn't see any records. Uh, I mean, as good as his resume, you know, but. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't think we had him. I mean, I think we would say the last high-profile coach. I'll agree with you on that. I mean, someone who came with a lot of reputation. Yeah, and yeah. Gary, you you mentioned this in, in the previous episode that the timing of his arrival just wasn't the best time, I would say. It was uh, It was just, you can say in Hokkien Sui timing. Not, it's very unfortunate because when he, be, when he was in charge of the national team, he witnessed one of the biggest shockwaves in Malaysian football where a core group of young players were among those who were swept away by the match-fixing investigations and subsequent verdicts. So mm-hmm. he was left with a much more skeletal squad to work with. But to be fair, Claude Leroy, during his time, especially in the Asian games, they were average. They may have gone to the next round, but one or two results make ensure that they were not able to go beyond the group stage in Hiroshima. Then you've got the match-fixing scandal that he has no part in. But thereafter, in 95, with the remaining young players that he had at his disposal, this actually I do remember because for some reason, the new paper actually did follow the Malaysia pre-Olympic team partially because Singapore and Malaysia were in the same group in mm-hmm. that first round of pre-Olympic qualifying. So what happened was, we recall that uh, Malaysia and pre-Olympic team they played against Japan and I yeah, think they yeah. also played the Santos All-Stars if, if I'm not wrong a group of eight aging Brazilian footballers but who could still offer something and but what happened in the end was even when you had a big name if you have that, that level of material here to work with there was nothing much he could really do yeah. so and later on, from what I read in the Straits Times, like in the Sea Games, I mean, which coach can withstand given just only three weeks to prepare for the Sea Games? Three, just three weeks before the 95 Sea Games. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep, that was another disappointing addition because when we lost the first game to Vietnam, it also turns out to be an historical defeat because the first time we lost to Vietnam. So we actually witnessed two... Uh, not so good results like in the 90s. First against the Philippines, then against Vietnam. Of course, at that time, I think we were all a bit naive about Vietnam. We did not expect what they were about to become in the next 10, 15, 20 years to, down the road. And unfortunately, we also had Indonesia and Thailand in the same group. Uh, I think we did okay. We managed to hold, we managed to hold Thailand, but uh, the defeat against Indonesia pretty much signaled the end and everybody was calling for his head, like, basically. Obviously, he had to go, lah, no choice. Actually, Sivan, the most ironic part was when Vietnam in the 95 Sea Games was led by Carl Heinz Wegan. Oh, who yes. Coach yes. Malaysian national team. Yes, yes, yes. And in fact, I remember in the news, uh, I think TV3 or something, they did ask whether if Carl Heinz Wegan was interested to come back and coach Malaysia. I think at that time, probably he would have analyzed the whole situation and said, nope, he is not going to take the job because, uh, I mean, there, there's little much that he could have done as well. But I think the next appointment, Wan Jama Hassan, so this is where I'm going to give it to you, Gary, because 96 Tiger, Tiger Cup. Cup, the inaugural Tiger Cup, which took place in Singapore. I think I will focus more on Wan Jama, Wan Hassan in terms of the Tiger Cup because when Wan Jama came in to fill... Uh, Leroy shoes after the 95 Sea Games uh, failed mission. Actually, Wan Jamak already had established himself as a well-known local coach, coaching a decently strong Johor team in the domestic league. And 
with the limited local resources, local, because he had good foreigners, they were able to be very competitive in at least at the top half of the standings and often giving Singapore problems when he was in charge of uh, Johor in the league. But the real breakthrough for Wan Jamak really came when it was in the Tiger Cup. I must admit though, even Singapore, we were not expecting a very resurgent uh, Malaysia side when they played against us in the opening game of the Tiger Cup, which is now we all know as the AFF Championship. So what happened was, because given that you, only, you still have your veterans in, I think Zainal Abedin was leading the line, lead, leading from the back as captain. Then you yeah, got, correct. Um, then you got K Samagamaran and Yap Wai Loon as the anchors in midfield. <clears throat> and I think if I'm not wrong, Dola Saleh was up front. And you got Kairu Azman still holding steady as the goalkeeper. And actually, when you have a core group of good players who were unaffected by the match fixing uh, sweep, they were actually on the opening game, they were more dominant against Singapore. And when Samba gave us the lead, we had a whole load to crime, a whole lot to crime because partially it's Singapore's fault. Who asked us to have only five days of training before a tournament? <laughs> Five days. <laughs> wow. Yes. Okay, okay. All right. That's something new. <laughs> we were too overconfident. Yeah. So finally save up save us the blushes deep in injury time. But unfortunately, but that's where actually Malaysia went from strength to strength. I remember them trashing Brunei 7-0. And then it's they the trashed the Philippines. Then they also whacked uh Brunei and they went all the yeah. way to the final. Yeah. Yep, yep. I mean, uh, just just going to go back a little bit, uh, be before that tournament, because the '96 Asian Cup, what I saw was a very optimism Malaysian team under Wan Jama. Because uh, it's been a while since we had a local coach, so when we went with the local guy, there wasn't much expectation given. But the fact that in a group we had Indonesia and India, it was oh, yeah. a huge opportunity for us to qualify for the Asian Cup. We did well. We managed to hold Indonesia zero zero in the first game. Unfortunately, in the second game between Indonesia and India, probably one of the most uh, bizarre things can ever happen in football. Uh, the Indian national team that came to KL for the qualifiers, I think they had about nearly six, seven players who were injured. So they really didn't have a full strength squad. They took the lead against Indonesia, but then their goalkeeper oh, got injured. Before that, their goalkeeper was injured. <laughs> and because of the, and because, of the, because of the goalkeeper injured, they had no trouble to bring in a substitute keeper. Now, that's how the keeper also got injured somewhere along the line and they have no choice. Oh. Bai Chung Butia, the star player mm -hmm. of the Indian team at that era, had no huh? choice but had to go in into goal. Yeah. And oh, that's, yeah. when, <laughs> that's when the whole floodgates started to come in. And I remember, uh, because what we, back then when we don't have live telecast, we used to wait for uh, the, the sports news, which I think is um, Bulletin Jam 10 or something like that, about 10.30 or 10.45, that we had to wait for the latest news. And when the news came out, the Indonesia won 7-1. Oh, man, we knew we had, a, we had a mountain to climb. But at the same time, we also had a bit of hope because of the fact that the Indian team wasn't at its best. We could actually try to, we could at least score six goals. We were doing okay in, the, in that last game. I think at one moment we were leading like three nil or two nil, but unfortunately, Bai Chung Butia decided to turn up in that game, scored a couple of goals, and we could only win five two. So Indonesia made it to the Asian Cup and we didn't. So, you know, that whole experience gave me a bit of hope that maybe we might do well. But, Russ, since yeah. you're the Malaysian fan who is living in Singapore, and in a group which together with Singapore, I mean, what was going through your mind, man? And how optimistic were you that this team was going to do, do so well? Okay, so thanks for bringing me into this conversation. I was dying to speak about this. Uh, 1996 was the first time I started. I this By this time, I already picked my national team. So Malaysia would, would be my national team. And so the first tournament I would watch religiously uh, following Malaysia would be... 1996 uh, Tiger Cup. And I remember coming into the tournament, not much uh, coverage, not say coverage, not uh, Malaysia weren't fancied to do well in the tournament. So, you know, of course, I know about the Singapore players, 
and of course thailand is always fancied indonesia is fancied to do well and uh, but nobody really talked about malaysia but you know like uh, what uh, gary spoke about the first game uh, malaysia held, held its own more than held its own against singapore and drew against singapore and then quietly malaysia just sneaked into the final surprising everyone knocking indonesia out i think that's when you know players like this uh, sambagamaran especially was the for me the star man of this uh, malaysian team but i remember zaina abidin ended the tournament as the player of the tournament playing as a Sweeper. libero i think even not even yes. mistaken samba got a few men of the match award right, All right. i think he, yeah, I think he got a few He's, yeah He scored a few goals and then you know no you know already know players like Azman Adnan and then there were other players you know B Rajini Khan came to mind from watching this tournament of course the name is uh, synonymous for people who watch uh, Tamil movies but this is a different Rajini Khan that is uh, we are watching here on the screen and you know of course goalkeeper we had Kairu Azman and uh, yeah so Dola Sale was there So it was a was a very interesting team, and you know, for once, you know, I thought yes, you know, we're, okay, we lost to Thailand, which is which is a bummer. You don't want to go to the finals and lose, but I felt you know after some time now, you know, maybe Malaysia could be on the on the rise here. I mean, for for me, the biggest satisfaction from this tournament was the fact that when we beat Indonesia in the semi final, I remember mm-hmm. I was following that game through a Singapore. For radio station, somehow or oh. other, I don't know whether you guys remember back then. You know, we had this uh, FM AM shortwave yeah, kind yeah. of radio station where you need to tune in to find the yeah. exact frequency. Right. So I managed to tune into one Singapore radio station. I can't remember which station it was, and they were commentating on the game. So that the that game, I mean, that was a, a extreme satisfaction, especially when I look back at the goal scored by Samsudin. Abdul Rahman, it was. I think it was a flying oh. header goal. What a powerful goal that was! Mm, it was, yeah. Mm-hmm. Two two nil up uh, in within sixteen minutes, and then two one at half time, and then sealed it in the seventy six minute. Mm-hmm. I don't know, Bala. What you you and Elvin in the same class and all that back then? I mean, what were what you guys were? What was going through with you guys when it comes to this tournament, especially? I think this was like what you you guys mentioned. This was uprising of the Tigers or even Malaysia for this matter. So I think it was interesting spectacle, especially like what uh, Ras was saying about Samba Gamara. You know, he was the I think he was the man of the tournament. He was so, actually the second highest top scorer, six goals. Yeah, for for a defensive midfielder and kind of libero kind of this is movement and uh, and the storm kind of uh, character. Uh, end of the day, you know, the Thailand still showed. The who the big boys, but I think it was a surprisingly good, good win for Malaysia lah to be there and to perform. I think it's one of the one of the remarkable achievement. Apps, it was a good respond after all that that uh, dark era, yeah. and we kind of felt that maybe you know the the, the bad days are behind us. But anyway, guys, uh, just to let you all know, the, we didn't losing to Thailand was no shame at all because the goal scorer was Kathy Sooks in Amuang, who will mm. go on to play for Huddersfield Town. I thought you guys need to know that. <laughs> and one more thing also, Malaysia, when Malaysia played Thailand in the final, they were playing in front of 40,000 Thai workers who entered free of charge. Ooh. Ah, okay, I mean, okay. And also, I think there were a lot of Malaysians as well in the crowd that, that were, you know, either working here or just came across the border from Johor. I mean, obviously, this tournament was a, a, a huge success despite the fact that we didn't win. It gave us a whole amount of hope that going into 97 in the sea games in jakarta that we will we will finally uh, overcome all the the hoodoo that has been plaguing us over the last three sea games i, I don't know whether you guys uh, maybe you guys can help me out on this i know we did well we won the first two games then we lost quite badly to indonesia quite badly to the point that i think the papers say that we ended up becoming malaysia indonesia treated us like fried chicken And then we had a, a a very crucial game against Laos, a, a do or die game. Basically, all we needed to do is not lose the game. We were gone through to the semi final, but unfortunately, um, again we, we draw, right? Ah, uh, no, we didn't draw. We oh, were we drawing, lost. but we lost. I think we lost from a very un unfortunate I... error from Kairul Azman. Uh, I think he was trying to push a cross or something like that, but the ball ended up going into the net. And we lost the game, so it, it was definitely 
the domino effect started lah from that moment onwards with regards to the public support for the national team because uh, as the years gone by after that, it, things did not recover. It, I mean, it took a bit of while for things to recover. And of course, you know, uh, we also had 98, the Tiger Cup, which I think, Gary, maybe you can able to explain to us what exactly happened. But before that, I know we had the World Cup, France 98, and then not too long after that, we also had the Commonwealth Sea Games. And I think Malaysia at that time were in a bit of a hangover from these two major events. But what actually happened was actually rather unusual when it came to Tiger Cup 98. Singapore came in as underdogs actually because while we did reach another Sea Games semi-final in 97, the public weren't so pleased because we lost out on the bronze medal after a very hotly contested semi-final. And that aside, that was when Fundy decided to retire from international football along with Malik Awab and David Lee. So there was a big transition. But what actually happened in the opening game against Malaysia was really one of the more unusual Singapore-Malaysia games I have ever witnessed because for some reason, that game was rather devoid of that kind of intensity of rivalry that you expect from, I think, both teams. Not because partially, I was also quite surprised when I looked at the Malaysia team that was fielded. I was like, okay, there were no players that were very familiar. And from what I read later from Football Asia magazine, it's like it was almost an experimental squad, like an under-23 or under-21 squad with Hatim Sosi as the national coach. And mm. Singapore, where you have some experienced pros who are still around and some emerging young players in Ahmad Latif and Gusta Guzarisha and Sasi Kuma along with ID. And you got a few solid uh, players like Subraman, S. Subramani. So the thing is, it's a bit of a mismatch where you got a team that has some experience against an entirely very raw squad for a senior international tournament. And I don't even recall Thailand playing that kind of squad even for any AFF championship. Although I think they did it somewhere before in all four, but that they also didn't do that well, although they had the Sak Chaiman and a few other seniors to lead. But this Malaysia squad was very unusual. It's like, hey, what happened? Where are where are your senior players? Only Samba Gamaran was a survivor from 96 in that squad. But even then, I think that opening game is like it's very anonymous and Malaysia barely threatened us. That is the very unusual part in the mm-hmm. game. We have with the better composure, we had the better play. And we scored two goals. And the flow of game was more in our favour. Malaysia, they tried, but for some reason, it didn't feel like man- many of the Malaysian team were that ready for this level of competition. And I, I think mean, many of the names yeah. after that, you don't really hear from them again for yeah. wearing the Malaysia jersey after this tournament. Yeah. Mm. yeah. I mean, what, what actually happened was uh, after the 97, uh, after the 97 uh, failure, the FAM went on a very extreme, took an extreme measure by disbanding the entire national team program and oh, yeah. decided to send, I think, quite a lot of uh, players that was from the 97 World Youth Team. I think uh, quite a few right. names were there. And I think they were only a handful, I think, Sanba, Gamaran, and maybe I think, I can't remember, maybe other one or two senior players. So it was a very, like what Gary mentioned, as a very raw team. But unfortunately, you know, in Malaysia, that entire edition of the tournament went almost unnoticed. It like never happened. No, I, I think Bala, even you, can you recall anything about this tournament in '98? I think basically, I think it's just like uh, yeah, I think because at that time, I think everybody was full focused, like what is it with two big tournaments uh, coming, uh, what was ongoing with the Commonwealth, everything. So I think the fans football was the and I think with all a lot of damages we done over three years. I can't remember any even now you're talking about this I'm just trying to googling up with anything happening in the 98 there you go there you <laughs> go seriously guys I mean even in the papers also it, it was a very small article that just previewed the tournament that was it and yeah. we didn't know what was going on after that and then only uh, I think it was in the football mundial episode whereby I found out that Singapore won 
Uh, the goal scorer was this six foot player by the name of Sashi Kumar. <laughs> Thinking, where did Singapore found this guy, man? <laughs> well, he was already found from ninety five when he was playing for the pre Olympic team. So ah, uh, okay, okay, okay. So he was already an emerging defender from the system, and he had already he was already in the national team in ninety six. Hmm. Okay. All right. So yep, that pretty much uh as mentioned, once 97 happened, it pretty much started the domino effect in terms of the public support when it comes to the national yeah. team and also with Malaysian football for that matter. Uh I mean Russ, is there anything you want to add up from this moment on? Yeah, on the on the 98 one, you no, know, that first game against Singapore, I was watching it and like what Gary said, you no, know, it's very unlike a Singapore Malaysia match. Singapore Malaysia wasn't in it at all. All right. And uh, Singapore won it quite easily. Not e- not easy for me to go back to school after that. Uh, because because getting, Singapore ended up winning the Tiger Cup. Yeah, on top of that, yeah, wow. <laughs> Singapore ended up winning the Tiger Cup. Like, wow. That just adds uh, rub salt onto the wounds. Uh, but yeah, you know, this, um, we're talking about Malaysian squad. I did take a look. Kali Jamlus was there, but nobody really had an impact on that tournament. Uh, Sambagamaran also... Wasn't much, uh, uh, didn't do as well as he did. And yeah, it was, it was very disappointing uh, tournament for Malaysia. It was it was absolutely disappointing. Lah. But uh, that's pretty much wraps up the entire decade of Malaysia because I can't remember, was there anything? Oh uh, yeah, of course we had a C-Games. Games. 99 had a C-Games. Games. In Brunei, which of course there was another dark chapter we end up losing to... You lost to Singapore again. <laughs> again, okay. I think but, we lost yeah. to Indonesia quite badly. I know, correct? but but that said, that Sea Games match between Singapore and Malaysia was a lot more competitive. Mm, okay, was that the first time the Sea Games became an under twenty three format? No, that was okay. in two thousand and three. Oh, okay. Two thousand and one. Okay. Sorry, I think. Oh, okay. The one that hosted by in KL. Yes, right? correct. Mm, okay. Okay. So, yep, that pretty much uh, wraps up the entire decade of Harimau Malaya in the 90s. As I mentioned to you guys earlier, I don't know whether you guys can agree with me. When it comes to the domestic league, Malaysian football is very colourful, but not yeah. much can be said about the national team. I don't know. What, 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 what do you guys yeah. think about that? I think it was quite disappointing. Um, okay, well, the first part of the 90s, Personally, I wasn't too invested. I wasn't really sure or, or clued in on what what was going on. But at least after, since I became a fan, I think a lot of times I remember in the 90s, as I said, you know, going to school and, you know, you play against Singapore in these kind of tournaments and you lose. And then you go to school and then your friends are going to laugh at you because, you know, why, what type of team are you supporting and they have, they've lost to us. And, you know, there's, of course, this rivalry going on between us and uh, yeah you know and of course since then uh, as years have passed by the some of the players that have played in these games like uh, no ali is one of them you know um, by god's grace of course became we've become friends now and we've had uh, he's been on our podcast as well and we've spoken about it so yeah he's he's also taken the liberty to read me about it and but now of course we have uh, we are we have got the upper hand on the Singaporeans. But yeah, generally, if we talk about football for the Malaysian national team at that time, I think quite disappointing. And when I look back also in the history of the of Malaysian national team in the 90s, you look at where it started from 1989, winning the SEA Games and all the good players that we had in that time. And even the league was thriving in the early 90s before the the breakout of the scandal. So a lot of good Malaysian players as well and we didn't really capitalize on it, didn't really uh, dominate as we would have wanted to. I think that is a disappointment. And then after that, we had the after effects of the scandals and I remember all those where, you know, you were talking about disbanding the whole squad. I remember all those uh, from the newspaper articles I read uh, and back then, all this talk about disbanding squads and then bringing in a fresh squad, changing managers like changing clothes. You know, oh, so dear. all this very <laughs> unstable period. Yeah, indeed, indeed, indeed. Anyway, Bala, what about you, man? I mean, what's your overall view of Malaysia national team in the 90s? 
I'm sure there were some, we had some positive moments, lah, winning Pesta Mola Merdeka, a few things and all that. But generally, when it, I mean, SEA Games at that time still really mattered. We just couldn't get it done, man. One thing was particularly new highlighted was because, uh, especially this this, re- this region, basically, we are very focused on um, what do you call that? On this 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 achievement, Tiger Cup, no, the Suzuki Cup, the AFF Cup. I think we should look beyond this 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 this, uh, this level of tournament. But overall, I think Malaysia, I would say, is uh, like fifty uh, fifty. We have like uh, we have good time and bad time. I think it's time uh, if, if, we, if we want to call it Malaysia to look beyond uh, AFF Cup, Sea Games for matter. And uh, I don't know, maybe start with Asian Cup. I think we have qualified after so long in, uh, in this thing. I think AFF, AFF Cup should be more regarded as, uh, or even Sea Games should be regarded more as like, you know, a uh, stepping stone for players to move to a senior team. But rather than focusing on the team, of course, this is a lot of sentiment here. I don't, I don't deny that, but. I think even uh, Siamun also have mentioned before, I mean, uh, this part of region have to look beyond. I mean, you perfectly mentioned that we need to look beyond because that's where we are today. Where What do you see about the national team today compared to where it was at that time? I mean, back then we had Sanba. Today we have plenty of Samba in the team. <laughs> <laughs> literally Samba, literally. Yeah, I mean, that's that's the perfect way to put it, like, you know, with the inclusion of, uh, I know, this is something... It's really going to disappoint us with the inclusion of players <laughs> like Paulo Josue, Enric, and of course, we also have uh, Sergio Aguero in the team and, and a yeah. few other faces. I mean, wh- what do you guys see the national team? I mean, the transition over the years and where, where it is now. I mean, what's your take? I will go first, actually, because okay. my own observation of the current Malaysian national squad under Kim Bangon, because Kim Bangon actually previously with Hong Kong also had a similar history in bringing in naturalized players into the national team. So in a sense, in Malaysia, he's doing almost something similar, but there are also a number of core local born players that are also keeping the squad at a very competitive level, partially due to the JDT impact I'll call it the JDT impact rather than the influence because even without the without the even without the influence, JDT they are now the powerhouses of Malaysian club football and they also supply the core of the Malaysian national team into the squad. So when it's sometimes at times it looks evidently a bit different when you see the absence of the core JDT players in the squad. But on the other hand, I think Culturally wise, because it's such a shift. I mean, it began from the heritage players like Brendan Gunn, uh, Corbin Ong, or even Matt Davis. But now it has exploded into having committed foreigners who do not have any Malaysian blood into the setup. And I think while their commitment is undoubted, and while they also have linked up well with the local born Malaysians who are also in the squad, but I think it does set a trend because obviously previously Singapore has that and with 100% foreign born, we don't have a heritage player because of the duals, the singular, single citizenship issue. But I think in the near future, what you do need is when you have had that high level of player expertise, player expertise. And, and level. So what you need is you need the younger boys to step up to compete at a similar level to have a similar level of aspiration and I think where this current national team is concerned having qualified or merit is a wonderful thing it helped erase the goals of 2007 where unfortunately the national team was made up of veterans who were not cut off for the Asian game and a rather inept international local in- coach for international football at that level the horribles and abilities of Malaysia football so what I do look at is there is a big up there's an upward trend that's still going on, but thereafter, where does Malaysia football, especially the Malaysian national team, go from there? And especially when Malaysians still want to see your national team continue to push on in Asia to be competitive, to be fighting with the big boys and to give respectable scores, whether in victory, in stalemate, or in defeat. So this is where I do look at Malaysia national team. And it's definitely a lot better than what you all had, what you all had Malaysia experienced in the 90s. Although there was something very puzzling about the 90s. It's like 
you all had such good players in the 1990s, but for some reason, the international results were abysmal, especially the SEA Games. The Tiger Cup 96 was a big positive blip, but after that, for some reason again, I don't know whether to call it normal service resume or was there a big disruption on the talent development or is it because of the coaches that Malaysia had during that period? Like there was never a systematic flow on how you all want things and especially as what you, especially what Sivan mentioned earlier, the 2000s, the, sorry, the 1997 breakup of the entire national team, it's like quite overly drastic especially when the bridge is very wide between the under-20s and the national international level. Mm-hmm. Yep, yep. I mean, uh, what I would say, because I think context is very important here, SEA Games at that time was considered like the most important tournament in the region. All right. And Tiger yep. Cup was still in its infancy. Yep. So I suppose the pressure was mounting uh, as we didn't, after failing from the group stage, one edition after another, uh, I think 97 was like the tipping point where it became just unbearable uh, for quite a, a lot of people involved in football. So that that pretty much was, as I mentioned, that was where the domino effect started to shift in terms of the public perception towards Malaysian football. And as I mentioned earlier, because it was also simultaneously around the same time where you know the Commonwealth Games in Malaysia did superly well in so many other sports, whereby you tend to hear this narrative of uh, comparing the national Malaysia football with other sports, which, I mean, sometimes I feel it's a little bit unfair, but that's what it is. Lah. Anyway, Bala, I know where Ras stands on this. We will hear from him. Ras, hold on first. I just want your view on what do you think about having Brazilians, Argentinians, all, all these players in the national team? Is there something that you approve or you feel this is just a short-term thing that we need to find a long-term solution? For me, basically, Sivan, I think like uh, I think I mean this 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 blueprint is not uh, it's not it's not uncommon. I think even countries like I think Italy, Germany, uh, you know, they what they, even even I think half of I think not not half maybe three quarters of the French team were I think either immigrant or some kind of connection in the team. You see, so it's not something uh, totally it's the alien of the team, but. Uh, only thing is like the what uh, the imp- we can improve in certain way in terms of the uh, tactically uh, facilities the grassroots level I think it's still there to be to be to be developed lah. So if you compare to compare, I think the only state team which I think producing this quality is only Johor. Other than that, maybe like what I mentioned, like Slango might even fight with them. But other than that, I think Johor is still miles ahead. Mm-hmm. So I think I think because of them, I think Malaysia is having certain kind of a high profile situation right now. Mm-hmm. So where, where I'm coming from basically is I think Malaysia key with it. Uh, I think there's a the blueprints there. As long as a, as, a, as, a, as a country can can develop itself, I'm not so pro. You know, we might be might be pro naturalized, but we come from a country you not know, because I think a lot of nations do that. But continuous improvement must be done, and only the best of the of the uh, of the team can go lah. So Ras. I mean, yes. uh, leaving, leaving the floor to you. Actually, remember my uncle will be will always talk about you know Malaysia used to be able to beat South Korea and all, but look at where South Korea is now and look at where Malaysia is talking about that and always the I think for them that generation the benchmark is always the teams that you know had Santok Singh and uh, Moktadari, all these great legends. This was probably the golden era for Malaysian football and I think even till today I think Malaysia. Is struggling to reach that. But they are coming. So that also brings back to my point here because I feel that, you see, when Malaysia had, when Malaysia was glorious and had a golden period, as I mentioned, in the 1970s, uh, early 1980s and all, um, it was a team that was a mix of the races in Malaysia. You know, we had, we had all, kind of, all the races were represented, a good mix. And with regards to naturalization and uh, heritage players, I think like Sivan has, uh, sorry, Bala mentioned German players. Some players are um, sons of immigrants. But that's the thing, you know, they are sons of immigrants. They might be born outside, but they came to, the, came to Germany, they came to France, countries like this when they were very young. So it's like, okay, they're... 
maybe in their childhood they came to this country so literally most of their life they've been in that country and they've grown up there and i that one i have no problem if they then go on to represent the nation even in the case of malaysia i think for in the case of sumari the first person that broke this naturalization uh, pattern became a naturalized citizen at first i was also you know i i never liked it i always felt that you know when singapore had all these naturalized players i felt they were so called cheating you know they were just finding a shortcut finding a shortcut to success and that's how you know i get all these foreign players coming in they're, they're not good enough to play for their uh, parent country so they're here they are in in this country they're doing well because the standard isn't as high as they as it is in their parent country and there they are you know playing for national team doing well they win their cups and uh, so then when sumari came around i was a bit apprehensive but when i heard his story that he was here he was in malaysia since he was 13 i think then i'm fine with that i'm fine with heritage players because i myself would, would qualify as a heritage player myself if i was a footballer a professional footballer so i i'm fine with that as well because at least there's some link to the country you know through a parent to a grandparent there's still some link i find with that but i'm very i'm still very dicey on you know just getting players that are playing in the league uh, no matter how good they are as a foreign import player and all that no matter how good they are changing uh, you know giving them a national nationality the citizenship sorry and making him play for the national team and then i just can it just just doesn't sit well that for me is not international football i know it's happening in many different countries not just malaysia so many other countries are doing adopting the same pattern but i mean for me as an old school person i feel that's just not international football and also we got to look beyond i was mentioning this on uh, i wrote this on twitter as well i'm concerned with how the malaysian youth teams are doing because you look at uh, the results recently i think though no, it's not been it's not been good and i fear is going to go down the same path as singapore because when, when singapore had all these foreign players they did well in the, uh, in the national team did well until these foreign players retired and they stopped and then you know it just seemed like gem you know they are, now singapore football is the laughing stock of the region you know because there's no talent coming through and they're struggling big time so I, i'm afraid malaysia is going to go down that same path looking at how the youth teams are, are playing generally okay we seem to be like maybe third best fourth best in the region but that's not good enough i feel and bala said yeah we need to look beyond uh, c games look beyond aff but i feel we need to start at the c games and aff first we need to be winning these ones these tournaments win these ones dominate here then we can also at the same time look at qualifying regularly for asian tournaments going further in world cups that's what i feel we need to be doing we need to be looking at thailand looking at vietnam what they're doing and what they're doing well and emulating them there has to be like a conveyor belt of talent coming through the malaysian national team the youth teams coming through and you know making sure that you know okay we we play a, a, a weakened team in the aff but we're still good enough to be able to win or at least get to the final or the same and the same case when you go to the go and play in the c games it might be weaken a uh, youth team but still it's good enough a strong enough to go and maybe even win the uh, gold medals that is where malaysia should be aiming for that's my take on it all right guys uh with that said thank you so much for joining this episode we hope to do more collaboration with uh, with ras from the backpass with ras and thank you gary for being our guest on this episode as yeah, well thank you gary thank you sivan thank you all All right, guys. So, with that said, we will end this episode of the Bola Bola Show. Thanks for listening and goodbye.